Good morning, DrupalCon. Hey, how's everybody doing out there? It's wonderful to see all of you here. It's a beautiful day in Pittsburgh, and we are so thrilled to have you. Um, I am privileged to be the first person on this stage today to welcome you all here. My name is Tim Lennon. You might know me as Hestinet on Drupal.org. I'm the CTO of the Drupal Association, and we are the nonprofit foundation that supports Drupal and puts on DrupalCon, and we're thrilled to have you. Thank you so much. In a spirit of gratitude, I do want to say some thank yous. So first, a thank you to the Drupal Association staff and the more than 100 volunteers who are all here or getting sessions ready or mentoring or speaking. Thank you, everyone, for everything you're doing to make DrupalCon happen. I want to thank our sponsors as well. Their financial support makes all of this possible. Um, and these sponsors are not just vendors in some expo hall. These are people who help to build Drupal, some of the greatest experts in the community, people who've been here for a dozen years or more. And I encourage you to go to their sessions, talk to people, learn, and network with all of them. I also want to thank the supporting partners of the Drupal Association. Uh, you may not know the DA as a nonprofit organization runs Drupal.org as the infrastructure for the project. We provide security information, updates, localization hosting, all of these things, and all the tools you're going to use to contribute on Wednesday and to collaborate with each other throughout the con. So thank you to all of the supporting partners who've helped fund this work and keep the Drupal Association going. We really appreciate that support. Finally, I want to thank you, all of you as the attendees here in Pittsburgh, everyone who's come together. You are the heart and soul of this community. And DrupalCon is about people. It's about the hallway track. It's about meeting each other making new connections and new friends within the Drupal community, and I encourage you to do that throughout the event. So this week, we do need your cooperation. Um, here in Pittsburgh is the hometown of a beloved children's educator uh, in the United States that some of you uh, from the rest of the world may not know, Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers' message was that everyone, each and every one of us, especially the children, is special. Each person is unique and that we can all be more civil, more loving neighbors to, each, to one another. And in that spirit, we ask that you please cooperate with our COVID safety policy and wear your mask indoors throughout the event to help protect and support your neighbor who may be more vulnerable than you and who needs your support. We also remind you of our DrupalCon code of conduct. If you're ever concerned about something that might be happening at the event, you can contact, contact the conduct at association.drupal.org email address or find a member of staff or someone at the registration desk and we'll get you support as soon as we can. Finally, please respect the photo policy. If you see someone wearing an orange lanyard, that is because they would like not to be photographed. So, you know, if you can find another angle, get the photographs you want, we love you sharing all of those, but please re respect those who do not want to be photographed. We also want to invite you to some events throughout the conference. So right after this keynote, we would like you to join us for the group photo. You'll go out the doors to the left, find the big DrupalCon. We'll all gather together to take this photo of the community together. We also want you to join us for the welcoming reception tonight in the expo hall. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we'd love for you to join us in contribution. Contribution is what makes Drupal thrive. Drupal is built by people. No one entity, no one person builds Drupal. It's you who builds Drupal. And you can join us throughout the week. You can find mentors. If you've never contributed before, you are probably the most important here. And we want to see you in contribution and help you take that first step. So a quick sneak peek at what's coming up for the Drupal Association. Um, and there's more that you'll learn about this throughout the week. In particular, there will be a public board meeting here tomorrow led by our CEO, Tim Doyle, and members of the Drupal Association board. There you'll learn more about what the Drupal Association is going to be doing over the course of the next several years, a plan to accelerate innovation by empowering makers, market ourselves as a platform of choice, and grow the Drupal Association. We'll also be showing a new open web manifesto, taking a stand for the importance of the open web and the future of the internet. One of the things that we're doing as part of these efforts to present a, a more modern Drupal, a better Drupal to evaluators, is we're going to be overhauling Drupal.org itself. So there's a new look and feel coming. Um, this is just a preview. This is not yet the final thing. It's not live. Don't start refreshing your phones. 
Um, but Drupal.org is going to be updated with some brand new information for everyone out there evaluating Drupal, looking to choose the best platform on the web for their needs. So look out for more on that information soon. Uh, and I want to say thank you to our design partners, Third and Grove, who's one of the supporters of the Drupal Association, and to the volunteers of the Promote Drupal Committee, which is made up of folks like you who said, we want to step forward and help build a more modern Drupal.org, a better presentation to everyone who's visiting, and invite them into our community. If you'd like to learn more about Drupal.org itself and the tools we use for contribution, uh, you can join the uh, Drupal.org engineering team panel where we'll be talking about that acceleration. That'll be here in the ballroom today. Um, you can also learn more about Drupal 7 and the plans for end of life by attending the security team panel that'll be happening today in room 323. Finally, and last but not least, DrupalCon Lille is coming soon, so save the date. Uh, registration will be live very, very soon, and you should look out for an interesting plushie hiding around the event that you can take a selfie with, perhaps, and earn a free ticket to travel to DrupalCon Lille. All right, with that, it is my pleasure, my privilege, and my honor to invite members of the community working group up to the stage to announce our 2023 Aaron Winborn Award winner. afraid that I was going to carry it up and show who it was. So. <laughs> uh, the community working group, uh, its mission is to foster a friendly and welcoming community for the Drupal people, for the Drupal project, and uphold the uh, Drupal code of conduct. We have a couple of events um, that are on the screen, cool. Uh, coming up, we have the community working group's office hours, where we're going to talk about anything you want to talk about in the community. We have a code of conduct presentation going during the community summit about how we created the new code of conduct that was just released. And then we have a community health team uh, where we basically are trying to recruit you to come be part of us, and that will be neat. Each year, the Drupal Community Working Group is honored to facilitate the selection of the winner of the Aaron Winborn Award. The Aaron Winborn Award is named in honor of longtime Drupal contributor Aaron Winborn, who lost his battle with ALS in early 2015. The Community Working Group, with the support of the Drupal Association, then established the Aaron Winborn Award. The award includes a scholarship and stipend to attend DrupalCon, with recognition during a plenary session at the event. Nominations for the award are submitted by community members, then members of the CWG, combined with past winners, vote to determine the winner. The award itself is handcrafted uh, each year by a member of the community. Uh, this year, it was designed and crafted by Russell Eck from Canopy Studios. Uh, we had a bunch of really great uh, winners and nominees over the past years, and it's our, it, it's our honor to introduce this year's winner. Uh, the winner has been a Drupal community member for over 17 years. One of the nominators wrote, what sets this person apart, however, is their unwavering commitment to kindness and their above and beyond dedication to the Drupal community. Another nominator wrote, their contributions have been immeasurable, and character and commitment to the Drupal community make them a shining example of what this award represents. Uh, this person is actually the person that granted me commit access to Drupal.org, and the voters did not even hold that against them. Uh, he's done a lot of work in Drupal. Oh, damn it, I said he. Uh, but more, more well known uh, to a project that I'm sure when I say it, it's going to give the person away, uh, DDEV. Uh, yep. And so let's spin up this year's winner, uh, Randy Fay. Beautiful that is. <laughs> so great. So great. Thank you so much. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I just, I, I'm just, I'm so honored, of course. And I know that there are so many of you out there that are, are more deserving of this, but thank you so much. And it's just, it's just a pleasure. And thank you so much for being such a great community to work with because that's what makes it so much fun to share and to work, you know, to work with you. You're, 
you're interested, you're engaged, you, and, and that's what makes DDEV uh, become what it is, is your involvement and questions and improvements and features, and, and it just, thank you so much, and uh, it's great to be here with you, and what a, what a pleasure and what an honor. All right. Thank you, Randy, and congratulations. Let's have one more round of applause for Randy. And now I'd like to welcome Tim Lennon back. This bubble wrap is broken. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. We won't take too much longer. It is time to get on with the show. So again, it is my privilege to invite onto the stage Dries Baitar, founder of the Drupal Project, co-founder and CTO of Acquia. Thank you, Dries. Awesome. Thank you very much. Good morning, Pittsburgh. First of all, Randy, congratulations. It's so wonderful to see you in after all these years. Yeah. Very proud of you. Very happy to have you. And for those that don't know DDAF, I don't know if we explain it, actually but it's a local development environment. Um, so check it out. If you want to run Drupal on your desktop, on your laptop, uh, you can use DDEF to do so. Um, good morning. Welcome to Pittsburgh. Uh, it's exciting to be here. I've actually never been to Pittsburgh. Um, it's first time for me. And on my way to Pittsburgh, I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I looked up a little bit about the history of Pittsburgh. And uh, what I learned is that it was originally um, or it's known even today for being sort of a, an industrial city, you know, creating steel and coal mining, these kinds of things. And I like that because it's a city where things are made, you know, a little bit like Drupal, things are made. And it's also a city that had to evolve itself over the years because obviously industries have changed and, and Pittsburgh has done that. And I like that as well. I like that because it reminded me of Drupal. You know, Drupal as a project, uh, we have a famous quote uh, that is, the drop is always moving. You may have heard about that. Um, and we have values and principles, and principle seven is all about that. Principle seven is about how we can sit still, how we have to keep innovating. Um, and so I really like that, and because of those things, I decided to make the topic of my keynote innovation. So we're going to talk about innovation today. Um, I think that's really important because if you stop innovating, as you probably know, you, you tend to lose. And that is not an option for us. It's not an option for us because the mission that we're on, what we do, is just too important. You know, we have to keep innovating. We have to make Drupal super successful, uh, if only because our mission is so great. And so the topic for today's innovation, I'm going to cover that in four uh, different segments. License to innovate jumping S-curves, and letting a 1,000 flowers bloom. And then I think the much-awaited Pitchburg, our innovation contest that we've been writing about um, in the last month or so. So let's start with the license to innovate. So um, to talk about that, I need to tell you a little bit about the history of the Drupal Association. Uh, the Drupal Association was actually created in 2005. And it was created because we started to organize events and we would solicit sponsors. And those sponsors in the early days, they would wire their sponsorship dollars to my personal checking account. <laughs> that's how it used to work. And obviously, that's not a great thing to do because technically, that is considered income. And I have to pay income taxes <laughs> on those sponsorship dollars. And so we decided we needed a better way. We needed a checking account that wasn't subject to personal income tax by me. <laughs> And so we created the Drupal Association as a tax-free or you know, non-profit checking account. And from there, we started adding other responsibilities to what the Drupal Association does. The Drupal Association got involved with our infrastructure, with Drupal.org. Some of you might remember me talking about the big Drupal server meltdown in 2005, where we had to buy much more infrastructure. Uh, the Drupal Association also continued to help with events, like this event. It's organized by the Drupal Association. Um, the Drupal Association then got more and more involved with helping to grow and foster the community, for example, by helping to run different working groups. 
And then more recently, the Drupal Association had gotten more involved with innovation. You can think about the Automatic Updates Initiative, Project Browser Initiative. These are all examples of how the Drupal Association is starting to help us innovate more on the product side. And I feel that's an exciting change, and we want to do more of that. And to talk about that, I would actually like to invite on stage uh, Tim Doyle, our new CEO, as well as Buddy, our chair of the Drupal Association. And we're going to talk about this for a little bit. Great to see. Hi. Awesome. Welcome. Welcome on the stage. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we're going to have a quick, you know, 10, 15 minute conversation about this. Um, maybe I'll start with Tim. Sure. Uh, Tim, um, you joined us eight months ago. Yep. This is your first DrupalCon. Well, this is my first official DrupalCon. <laughs> I, was, uh, I snuck into DrupalCon Prague because we were still in negotiations. Um, but the board felt it was important to me, for me to understand what DrupalCon is about. So I snuck in there. I was, uh, wore sunglasses, a hat, and a trench coat <laughs> so no one knew who I was. Um, but it was a very valuable experience to, understand, to get a better understanding of, of the culture of DrupalCon and of the, of the Drupal community. Yeah, so this is not your official first. It's your official first DrupalCon when you've been undercover. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, because most people probably have never kind of met you um, or know, sure. don't know a lot about you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I, my career has been mostly in government and not-for-profit uh, in the community development, housing, and finance space. Uh, in 2006, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, join a public sector startup that was created by state agencies here in the US um, just ahead of the Great Recession. Uh, state agencies saw storm clouds on the horizon economically because they saw the complaints coming in from consumers. And so from kind of a grassroots initiative, they got together and said, we need to build a system that allows states to work together uh, collaboratively on supervision, but maintain their independence. So uh, I was brought over um, to help build that system. And over the course of uh, 14 years, 15 years, I played different roles there product owner, product manager, marketer, salesman, to try to sell states, et cetera. So uh, that was probably the most meaningful experience and really, really where I got my, uh, my like kind of deepened my IT background and understanding what it means to launch a product, to develop a product, to uh, rejuvenate a product, et cetera. And you helped that grow to roughly I, what size? Yeah, the we did a great job. We were I was a second employee in 2006. We launched in 2008. Uh, we went from seven states in 2008 to 51 states, 50, well, 50 states in the District of Columbia using it by 2011. Uh, the staff grew from two to, on that project, about 50 or 60, and the whole organization grew to 170. So it was, uh, uh, we just did a tremendous job in, in fulfilling what the states wanted us to do, and I'm very proud of that. Awesome, and tell us a little bit about yourself that's maybe not on your LinkedIn profile, so to speak. Like not on my LinkedIn, fun okay. Facts? I'll try to keep this PG-13, so we'll try to, <laughs> Um, no, one, uh, you know, one thing that might be on my LinkedIn, but uh, in my 20s, I took a detour off of my career path, um, and I accepted a job. I left D.C. and accepted a job in Western Maryland working in the woods um, at an alternative school uh, for juvenile delinquents. It was an alternative to prison, um, and uh, the, these young men could decide to uh, go to prison or they could decide to spend 18 months at this school uh, living outdoors uh, in a campsite cooking over fire, chopping wood in the winter to stay warm. Um, and the goal was to form a community that would, um, with adults and these young men, to uh, help them reform their lives and uh, change the trajectory of their lives and take them out, really focus on group therapy and family dynamics, and then uh, bring them back so they could lead more productive lives. Um, and if anyone who has kids understands, it, it was the most challenging job of my life. It was transformative. Um, you, when you deal, um, in this arena, or if, if you're a parent, as I said, you understand that you face your own strengths, your limits, your weaknesses, your doubts are just right, uh, right in front of you. And uh, it was a, I would not be where I am today without that kind of detour on my, my career. Well, that's special. I don't think I knew that, actually. So thanks for sharing. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah. Um, let's go back to Drupal. So yeah. you've been on the job for about eight, eight months now. Um, any kind of observations or things you've learned so far? Uh, well, yeah, it's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. There, uh, there's a lot to learn. I, um, of course, I was aware of open source. I, we used Drupal after I had my old job, um, but I was not of the open source community. Uh, and so I really spent the first six months um, trying to learn and listen. Uh, you know, I really 
believe deeply that in, in order for me to serve the Drupal Association, to serve the board effectively, to serve the community, I need to understand. Uh, so I've, I've uh, met with um, uh, half the CEOs of our certified Drupal partner program um, and heard a, talked on a variety of issues. Um, but there are a lot of common themes that came out too. Uh, need to re-energize uh, uh, Drupal, bring back some excitement, especially getting young people uh, ramp up our efforts to get young people to be joining into Drupal, becoming part of the community, first time contributors, et cetera. Um, also need to tell the Drupal story. I heard you know, uh, folks talk about Drupal as, is an amazing product. Um, it's, some people say, oh, it may be, it, you know, there may be storm clouds ahead for it. But a lot of the CEOs told me, no, there's, there's so much there. We're not effectively telling the story. Um, and we need to effectively tell the story to end users. I imagine folks in this room you're here because you're already believers. How do we reach, how do we reach the non-believers? Um, and part of that is, I think, also identifying what is the market segment that we're going after in the future. Uh, and, and I know uh, the Drupal 7 conversation later today, I believe, will be part of that conversation too, about what is, you know, identifying the market segment and then aggressively um, going after that. Um, I also heard, uh, talked to a lot of community members. Um, the, uh, the community's incredibly committed uh, very impressed by that, incredibly creative, and incredibly opinionated. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the joke in D.C. Bet, the, <laughs> the joke in D.C., the, you know, I've dealt with a lot of lawyers in my life, and the joke is you get two lawyers together, you have three opinions. Well, I think you could get two Drupalists together and have three opinions. Um, but I think that contest of creativity is fantastic. Of, mm -hmm. of that's where the big ideas come from, and I think that's a good thing to have that contest. Awesome. And... Um, so you probably you know, picked this up, but you know, Tim has this interesting background with non deep nonprofit experience, but also growth and innovation experience, which we, we thought was very interesting. But maybe, uh, Barry, like, obviously you're the chair of the board. You were involved with the CEO search. You're part yes. of the, the search committee, as we call it, that um, you know, looked for um, our next CEO or ED. But take us back a little bit, because uh, obviously, as a board, we had you know, offsites and we brainstormed about what, what do we want to do and what do we want to look for. So maybe give us a little bit more of that context and background about how we, how we actually ended up <laughs> with Tim, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> True, like it was an interesting time, probably in 2019, I think it mm -hmm. was. And uh, in 2019, we said like, oh, wow, we are like, Drupal Association is financially stable. We have a lot of supporting partners. You know, what is next? And that question was asked in 2019, right? And we decided to meet in March 2020 in Atlanta. So the board came together, and I think it was on the 5th of March or something. Mm -hmm. And we all traveled in, and we were really excited, and we started on the first day with like, all these like, yellow posters, like, you know, asking questions, you know, where should we do, and what should we do? And then, basically, we got a phone call saying, like, hey, there is this thing happening in the world, and like, the schools are closing, so you should just maybe go home. And we changed from completely like, having this, like, what are we going to do next, into like, survival mode. And we were just like, OK, how are we going to do next DrupalCon? You know, what are we gonna, like, how, how is it gonna affect of us? Because like one of our, our profit that we have from DrupalCon is actually helping us to support the Drupal Association. So that was, of course, two years process, right? And um, I think the opportunity came, and of course the opportunity comes when we have, uh, when we need to search for a new person for the job. Mm -hmm. And then we say like, okay, so we did it again, but this time it was actually, we were able to sit in a room and, mm -hmm. and brainstorm. And we talked about uh, the Drupal project has always been run by Drupal, uh, by Dries and the, the core committers and the community. And the DA has been the supporting partner for the Drupal project. But now it was a little bit time, like, can we do something more? Because we hear it from the organizations. The organizations say, we want to contribute more to Drupal, but we just don't know how. We don't know like, what is going to make an impact. How can we actually change the needle? Because there are so many things that we need to do and we need to innovate. Um, and can we at the Drupal Association actually help with that? So we started to look at the things like you know, innovation, marketing. You know, how can we do that, those things? And that was the qualities that we were trying to look in the new CEO. And yeah, and of course, the, maybe you know, we are going to go into that on the next slide. But the, the big part is about how are we going to fund all these things? Yeah. So there's, I think, these three, you know, themes. It's going to be innovation, marketing, and, and funding. Yeah. So let's go into that. Yes. Um, 
So the last, I don't know, eight months or so, <laughs> we've been working on what we call our strategic plan. And so we've been having meetings, you know, all of us and other board members to kind of figure out what are the areas of focus. And, you know, Batty mentioned them, innovation, marketing, and fundraising to build more capacity. Um, but maybe let's go, and obviously there's like a layer of detail below those three high level uh, things. So let's, let's unpack that a little bit and let's give people uh, a little bit more color on what that means. And before we do that, um, let me say we just have to kind of stay high level yes. mm -hmm. because tomorrow there is an entire session dedicated to these topics uh, that will be in this room as well. Um, and I'll show you the details on the screen. I think they just came on. Um, so we can just kind of give you a teaser and then tomorrow if you're interested, you can come and learn more about all of these things. So but yeah, there'll be a lot more details tomorrow. But uh, yeah, there's three themes, innovation, marketing and uh, fundraising, which is the three year strategic plan. Um, and really with innovation, we're talking about uh, positioning the DA to be 100% focused on supporting makers, creating makers, um, promoting makers. How do, we, uh, how do we focus everything we do about leading to more makers? Um, and uh, we just hired uh, Alex Moreno. Alex, can you stand up and wave? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, uh, a first step into, into trying to add capacity at the DA, um, uh, because I, did, I came on, the, the finances are, are strong, um, but the board's ambitions are also strong, and we need to match our finances with the board's ambitions. Um, marketing uh, is uh, an initiative around um, getting to end users. So we'll be rolling out a number of initiatives around how do we, how does the DA take a more active role uh, yeah. speaking to end users? And maybe for a little detail there, like we have, we have a very small team, the Drupal Association, and if we want to do like marketing and we want to help with marketing of Drupal and we want to like help to bring that out to the companies, like how are we going to talk about Drupal, then of course we need to build up a lot of capacity on the marketing side as well. Right. So I think that's going to be challenged by how are we going to be able to do that because we are actually running on a, on a very lean budget, right? Yes, it's a very solid, stable, but lean. And, uh, um, but I, I would say I'm very impressed with the, with the Drupal board. We'd like to thank the board members that are here. Uh, we spent the last two days in a retreat, um, and folks flew in from all over the world to help plan this, uh, to, to just focus on the strategic plan and the things that the Drupal Association needs to do. One thing, as a new CEO always does, is looks at the board. And it's almost one of the most, if not the most important uh, decision in taking a job. Um, I'm, I was very impressed with the, with the Drupal Association board. Um, the last is, is fundraising, uh, and probably two things I'd say to that. One is we're looking at how do we raise revenues that we can then tr plow back into these marketing efforts and these innovation efforts. Um, we'll look at that in generally two, two ways. One is uh, what do we do now and how do we, how do we build on that? And second is to uh, begin to develop a philanthropic mindset at the Drupal Association. Um, and that's, that's a longer term project, so that's not something that you do in six months or 12 months. Um, but uh, the good work in supporting the open web, um, and uh, we are a digital public good now, um, these are things that, that philanthropic funders look for in an organization that they can get behind. And so we want to find funders that are aligned with our mission. It's something that we've never done at the yeah. Drupal Association. We've never applied for a grant. And as you probably know, there's a lot of grants out there in the world. Um, so one of the things to help us with that is to really focus a little bit more on the open web as being a key part of our purpose. And so one of the other things we've been working on is a manifesto. Right? Yes, and you'll, uh, at the board, open board meeting, we'll be presenting on that, so you'll see the details, have a chance to, uh, to read that. Uh, but it really is our statement. When people ask, what is, what is the Drupal Association, what is the Drupal community about? We're about an open, inclusive web. And it's the manifesto that really lays down our values in this. And that speaks, hopefully, to the wider world, but certainly will speak to funders. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. Oh, thank um, you. I'm going to ask you to yep. exit the stage. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, if you want to learn more about this, uh, join us tomorrow. Uh, we can go into a little bit more detail and also expect us to communicate more and more of these things as we uh, finalize them. So next, I want to talk about jumping S-curves. <laughs> um, so let's talk about what that is. So what do I mean when I say an S-curve? And uh, here's a slide that I've shown before. Uh, you might remember that from different keynotes. And it's basically a classic chart of how innovation evolves, right? So 
you see these S-curves. Uh, typically, the beginning of the S-curve is um, so an innovation that starts off slowly. In the middle of the S-curve, you see like rapid innovation, and then it peaks out. And then the next S-curve kind of starts um, at the end um, of the previous S-curve. And eventually, you have to make the jump to the, from one S-curve to the next S-curve. You know, you have to make that leap. And that's what I mean when I say you have, we have to like jump S-curves. And so to stay relevant, an organization or an open source project or really anything in the world needs to be able to make these jumps. And there's many, many examples of that. Like one great example uh, that I actually learned about from uh, Guy Kawasaki is around refrigeration. I don't know if you know this, but back in the day, uh, there was this thing called ice harvesting, where people would dig ice out of frozen lakes in winter and then distribute that ice um, to different you know, restaurants and places and homes to basically preserve food. And it was a hard challenge, and people would do all kinds of things to store ice and try to make the ice last until summer. It's incredible. And eventually, there was like an S curve jump innovation, which was an ice factory. So now imagine these huge factories producing ice and then still doing the same thing, distributing ice around um, for food preservation. That eventually led to a personal ice factory, which became a fridge or a freezer, right, which we have today. And so it's a classic example of how technology evolves. Uh, and there's many others. And, and there's a few important things we can learn from all of this. And so if you look at home entertainment as an example, um, and you can see on the screen sort of the different S-curves, but an important lesson is that going from one S-curve to the other can actually be a little scary and often is polarizing. And that sounds a little bad, but let me give you two examples. One, imagine going from rental stores to shipping DVDs. Well, guess what? The rental stores went out of business. They're pretty much gone if they're not entirely gone already. And that wasn't an easy transition for them, obviously. A more recent example is going from traditional TV, where you had advertising, to streaming TV. And all of a sudden, people could jump over the ads. Guess what? That was extremely polarizing for the advertising industry. They weren't very happy with that, right? But it was still an unstoppable uh, innovation. Another great example of um, sort of S-curves is around uh, communication. And you can see that here, how we went from the telegram to the telephone to the cell phone to eventually a smartphone. Um, and what's interesting about this one is that it often can take time for sort of the next S-curve to be recognized. These S-curves coexist for a while, and often we poo-poo the new S-curve, you know? And an example of that is the telephone. There's this famous quote that you can see on stage. It's from Western Union, basically saying the telephone is never going to be relevant. <laughs> And obviously, they were very wrong about that. And similarly, more recently, with the advent of the smartphone, um, we didn't really realize how powerful the smartphone was going to be, and that it could be used for much more than uh, phone calls. Now, here's another uh, S-curve, the camera, which is a subject that I love. <laughs> I love photography, so I study photography a little bit, at least. And you can see there was an evolution from cameras using glass plates. These were big, bulky cameras back in the day to a more portable camera, which ended up becoming the 35 millimeter analog camera. Uh, and then from there, we went to digital cameras and ultimately smartphones have overtaken basically cameras. Now, what's interesting about this example, and you'll find this in all of the example, examples, is that very often the beginning of an S-curve starts with a single person or may, maybe a very small group of people. And in the case of the 35 millimeter camera, it was Oscar Barnack. And he actually had a health condition where he couldn't drag along these heavy glass plates cameras. And so he set out to build a portable camera. And he did something very cool. So at the time, cinema or film was very popular. And he decided to take a spool of film, you know, you've seen these big spools, and to flip it on its side, to turned 90 degrees, and he then decided to build a camera around a single frame of a roll of film. Wasn't that cool? <laughs> Instead of using these big heavy glass plates. And so that led to the first kind of portable camera. Now, um, 
Barnack was lucky to work at a company called Leica. And Leica at the time was building uh, microscopes. And so they had a lab and tools to like build things like microscopes. And obviously that helped them build a camera. And Leica also had a great boss. And he, he saw music, he saw some potential in this early camera. And he helped him basically commercialize his prototype camera that he built for himself, this portable camera and to bring it to the market. And you can see, as an example here, some old advertising. It says, Klein Film Camera. And I'm not German, so doing my best. <laughs> but I can read what it is because I speak Dutch, and it means small film camera, or small portable camera. Anyway, so Leica started promoting this camera, and many, many years later, eventually, it led to this 35 millimeter cameras being mainstream, like every Nikon, Canon, all these cameras that you know were all coming out of this little innovation by Oscar Barnack. And the reason photos are the size that they are is because the original size of a, a flipped uh, you know, film strip. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. Um, anyway, the lesson is um, innovation can start with one. The power of one is an important lesson as well. Now Drupal has made several jumps on its own. In the early days of Drupal, we were kind of at the end of the static web and at the beginning of the dynamic web, I would say. You know, PHP and MySQL were just born and it allowed us to build much more dynamic websites. And Drupal successfully transitioned over a few S-curves, you know, call it the social web, the mobile web, web 2.0, whatever you want to call it. We rode that wave up and there was a jump in S-curve. Now the next question is, what's going to be next for Drupal? Some people say, is it Web3 with crypto? Is it AI? Is it JavaScript? Is it headless? But really, who knows? <laughs> we don't really know, because as I mentioned, these S-curves, they can be, you know, they coexist, and it's not always clear what the next S-curve is gonna be. And so the trick, you know, the thing that we need to do is we need to figure out what that S-curve will be, and then eventually make the jump, right? now. The tricky part is there is no real user manual <laughs> for how to do this. It's hard to do, but from these examples that I gave, there's a few lessons, a few things that we can learn. In fact, we can learn how it's not done. <laughs> and it's not done um, aimlessly, right? If you think about these examples, there's always some kind of vision or purpose. Barnack wanted to build a portable camera. That was his vision, he had a cl clear purpose. Uh, we also know it's not done by an innovation council. It's not necessarily top-down. It's very grassroots. It's somebody somewhere deciding to build something cool. Um, and again, the Leica example is a, is a great example of that, a single person trying to solve a problem. We also know it's not pure luck. Usually, there is a support environment, something that helps an idea flourish something that helps an idea become big. And again, in the case of Leica, it was the lab that he worked in. It was also his boss that wanted to help commercialize uh, his invention. Uh, so he had a strong advocate or supporter. Um, so we know that is also often the case. And finally, we know that it doesn't happen overnight. Because it was actually a long time between Barnack inventing his camera and 35 millimeter film becoming a big thing. These things take time. All right, so these are four kind of ingredients. Purpose and vision, some sort of individual, a supportive environment, and then time for the idea to grow and develop. Um, so that's how these S-curves happen. Now, there's a lot of people that invent things <laughs> that don't result in an S-curve. Maybe it's one invention out of a thousand, let's say. And so that's where we have this notion of letting a thousand flowers bloom. Like we need to create an environment where people can create things and we can launch lots of different experiments and see which ones will actually take off in a very grassroots way. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So to map it onto what I just said, to let a thousand flowers bloom, you need a sun because we want experiments and innovations to grow towards something, right? A vision and a purpose. We also need seats, people that create ideas. 
Um, sorry, let me talk a little bit more about purpose. <laughs> and so the good news is we have purpose, and we have a vision in Drupal, right? We know we're all about the open web. We want to build a web in a way that makes it accessible and inclusive and safe and secure for everyone in the world. And that's an important vision or purpose. But we also have a vision, and I talked about this at the last DrupalCon uh, in Portland, where I said Drupal is for ambitious site builders, right? And I showed this slide, actually, and maybe I'll recap it real quick, but this is a slide from my presentation, and I said, what makes Drupal unique is that we appeal to these site builders and that we're going back to our roots. On the left, you have developers. Developers write code, they use a command line, they're very technical, they love frameworks. And on the right, you have uh, content authors and site builders. And they like to not write code or they don't know how to write code. They like to use the UI, drag and drop, WYSIWYG, those kinds of things. And they love using SaaS solutions, but there's this interesting gap in the middle between developers and content creators, which I call the ambitious site builders. It's the people that want to use the UI, but if necessary, they can also use a little bit of code. They might be able to use the command line. And when I announced this at DrupalCon Portland, people really liked it. I got a lot of positive feedback. Now, people also asked me, like, can you talk a little bit more about it? Because as we think about building things for these people, we need to better understand what they are, these people, and what they like to do. So we workshopped this a little bit, and we'll have to do more work on this, but just to help you understand this a little bit better, the ambitious site builder doesn't always, doesn't typically identify as a developer. They, they wouldn't call themselves a developer. However, they're very technically savvy, which is a different thing. Um, they can use the command line, on a basic level, but they might be a little bit nervous about it, right? Imagine somebody having to execute a, something on the command line, being a little bit nervous and executing it and then feeling a huge sense of empowerment, like, wow, <laughs> I just did something really cool on the command line. They don't like getting stuck with SaaS solutions, and they really wish we had like a layout builder and page builder, these kinds of capabilities as part of Drupal. So more on this. Uh, later. Um, then we need individuals, right? The power of one. Uh, and that can be anyone. And guess what? What's better than the power of one? The power of many. And we have many, many people in the Drupal community that can help us innovate and that can start great ideas. And I want to highlight one, which is Kevin Quill. And I don't know if he's here. I hope he's here. Um, but Kevin single-handedly started to create the OpenAI ChatGPT integration. And I think that's interesting because I remember the early days of the web and I was so excited about the web's potential. And as I tried ChatGPT, I felt that same sense of excitement, right? Now, there's a lot of questions about AI, legal questions, ethical concerns, and we have to figure those out. But I love that Kevin took the initiative to build an integration so we can start learning about it, we can ex start experimenting uh, with it. So you can see here in the video how um, he, he, he was using ChatGPT to automatically generate some text, uh, which I think is uh, pretty interesting. And you can see that he's gonna do a few other things, like, um, some, like suggest a title. So one of the features is you write all of this text, and then you can go ask for some title suggestions. And then you can very quickly incorporate these titles in your articles, press releases, blog posts, uh, you name it. In this case, you have to copy paste it. Um, in the future, there might be even easier ways uh, to do that. Another capability is the ability to summarize text. So next you'll see Kevin highlight some text and then uh, you know, summarize it, which is also quite interesting. I'm excited about this too because some of our competitors recently did press releases. And in the press release, they said, we are going to invest in this. <laughs> and here we are in Drupal um, already with a fully functional um, yeah, prototype. <laughs> Everybody can use this today, by the way. You just have to install the modules. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, so next is sort of that support environment, the soil. And the good news is that Drupal has this 
Like we have an incredible supportive environment and it starts with our license. The open source license gives everybody the four freedoms. Everybody can use Drupal, change Drupal, share these changes. It's in, that's incredible soil for a supportive environment. But we have more. We have all of the tooling that the Drupal Association created, the tools that allow us to collaborate with thousands of people. Um, we also have a lot of processes and documentation and governments. We have events like this that all encourage people to com contribute. And in fact, we recently hit 50,000 contributed modules. Did you know that? It's pretty cool. Um, all right, but that doesn't mean we're done, right? It m means we have a lot of great things going and it has led to a lot of great innovation, but we should always ask ourselves, what else can we do? I wanna briefly focus on two things. The first thing is product innovation. I believe that everything starts with Drupal being great. If we don't have a great product, the rest doesn't really matter. You know, Drupal needs to be so compelling that everybody wants to innovate on top of Drupal. That is a key thing. And I'm very excited because Drupal 10.1, our next release, it's just like a week or so away or a few weeks away, um, will be filled with new features. I think I've never seen a minor release like Drupal 10, the one that has so many new innovations. So let me, yeah. <laughs> let me talk to some of them. Uh, single directory components, great for designers. Um, a streamlined content modeling experience, also really cool. More flexible block and page management. We added accessibility testing to core. That will be great. We've also added this new capability so that we the Drupal Association specifically can send you messages in Drupal. Maybe there's a new release or a security release. Um, we can notify people about events so we can bring more people into the community. We've made improvements to the content authoring experience. Um, you can see that here. It's kind of using Markdown and it automatically recognizes uh, formatting things. Then we've also made Drupal faster. We've made improvements to BigPipe, We've made uh, performance improvements to the toolbar, uh, so Drupal 10.1 will be faster as well. And these are just a few things. There's actually many more features that I couldn't fit into this slide or in this keynote, but I hope you will learn about all of them this week. You're at the right place for that. <laughs> and I'm sure there's many sessions about it. The second thing we should focus on is how can we simplify the innovation process? How can we simplify the contribution process and just a few weeks ago, all of the core committers, we met in person for the first time. And we spent three days together. You can see some of the photos. And we created hundreds of stickies with ideas of how we can simplify things, all the way from improvements to our tools, all the way to how we streamline our governance and decision-making processes. But also, we talked a lot about culture. For example, one of the things we talked about is how can we make sure that perfect isn't the enemy of good? How can we go faster? Now, I can summarize three days of brainstorming and work in this keynote. I just wanted to let you know that we had that meeting and that we left that meeting pretty excited and that there's more things to come. All right, so next is time. We need to give sort of these innovations time to grow. But the other thing that we need to do is we need to then find ways to spotlight great innovations. Right? If you have all these innovations happening everywhere, how do we tell people what's important and what's not important? Can we help grow certain innovations faster, the ones that have potential? Um, and that's actually where things like the project browser will come in. Originally, right now, the project browser is focused on helping people um, install and update and find um, Drupal modules, but in the future, we can do more to spotlight great innovations. Imagine the App Store on your phone. It doesn't immediately go to update these things. It will also help you discover great new things that are being launched on the App Store. We can do similar things in the future to help like, um, everybody in the community learn about great innovation. Recipes is another key component of that. It's not on the slide, but recipes is also a way to bring innovations um, to you know, end users. Hopefully you'll learn more about that in the initiative keynote, uh, which I believe is tomorrow or Wednesday. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's other presentations about this as well. And so really, to summarize this part, 
we want to give the Drupal Association a license to help us innovate. You know, maybe philanthropy can lead to a million dollars that we can then use to fund extra capacity. Um, we want to think about how to improve velocity and remove friction from the contribution process so that it becomes more interesting to contribute. Then we want to have tools to identify and nurture all of these great information with things like Project Browser. And then last but not least, we want to continue to make improvements to Drupal, the product, as well. Um, so I feel pretty good about all of these things. Now, if we do all of these things, we should see a lot of great innovation. And in fact, we have a lot of great innovations already. But at some point, we'll also have to make the leap, the jump from one thing to another. And we may not know yet what that is today. Um, but as I explained, based on the example, sometimes we're going to have to make some risky decisions or we have, have to make a decision that might be, um, that might leave certain people behind, you know, because we can be everything uh, to everyone. So we have to be willing and able to make the jump when we see the next S-curve. So I want to leave it at this for now, but next I want to talk about Pitchburg. So uh, Pitchburg is an innovation contest that we launched about a month ago, not that long ago. And we have five judges that I actually would like to invite on stage to come on. Um, you already know me. <laughs> you already know ba Buddy, as well as Tim from the Q&A. But we have two new people on stage. One is Julien uh, from Skilt. And then we have Martin from Acquia. <laughs> Welcome. Um, you might wonder why, why are these our judges? Well, you know, Patty and Tim and myself, we started this. <laughs> and then we collected money from different sponsors. And Skilt and Acquia gave sort of the most money. And so they were able to uh, send somebody or, you know, basically nominate one of their employees uh, to be the judge. So that's how we ended up here with the five of us. And in the last month or so, we collected 35 submissions. Very cool. Um, and we raised $75,000 from different organizations that you can see on the screen. The Drupal Association uh, pitched in money, Acquia, OneX, uh, Skilled, Palantir, um, Digital, uh, Polygon, Zucha, and ImageX. They all contributed to this contest. So thank you to them um, for, yeah, thank you, for helping us with this. So we had 35 videos. And then what we did is each of the judges actually watched each of the 35 videos. And we had a scorecard, and we ranked each video based on a number of criteria, things like um, how big of a problem does this solve? Um, and also, like, what would be the impact on Drupal? How many people would benefit from this innovation? And, you know, stuff like that. And so we ended up each with our own individual ranking of these 35 videos. So we independently ranked them. And then we aggregated our rankings, and we ended up with sort of a combined ranking. <laughs> and then we basically took the top seven of those submissions, and those are, we gonna, those are the ones we're going to show you uh, today. Now, there is another step involved here, because we can actually fund all seven of the top seven that we selected. So after we watch the videos together, we're going to ask you, the audience, to help us narrow down the selection to the ones we can actually fund. And I'll explain that in more detail later. I just wanted to give you the highlights um, so that um, you pay attention, <laughs> because you're going to have to vote um, after watching the videos. Uh, so we're going to show you the videos. Uh, they're shown in random order. They're not like ranked by our um, ranking. Uh, so let's do that. Hopefully, you're excited about it. All right, let's go. <laughs> All right, we start with, do you hear me? We start with the first proposal. Um, it's a decoupled layout builder, and uh, it, the submitter is previous next, Kim, and they are known in the community for contribution. And what they are thinking about, and this is a theme that we actually got a lot of submissions around this topic, and why? Well, we want to be enabling ambitious site builders to actually do their things, and what he's going to be talking about is um, how to rebuild the layout builder with React. And let's just take a look. Hi, I'm Lee. I'm a developer for Previous Next in Australia, and I'm here to talk to you about an exciting project that will transform Drupal's layout builder. 
Today I'll walk you through our vision for the couple editing that will shape the future of Drupal. A bit about us first. Our previous next, we're no strangers to Drupal contribution. In fact, we're proud to have been amongst the world's most prolific contributors to Drupal over the past decade. With your investment, we're going to improve the layout and the UI experience. We'll do this by rewriting it using React. This will dramatically enhance the content editor experience and in turn bring Drupal into the modern era of web UX. So where does this need come from? Layout Burner was built using Drupal technology that hasn't changed much in 10 years. Page edits use Drupal's Ajax API, and this means a round trip back to the server for UI updates. It's an experience at odds with what users expect from the modern web. Applications that leverage modern JavaScript frameworks perform optimistic updates. They update the UI immediately and then update state on the server in the background. We want layout retrieval and updates to happen in real time for more dynamic editing. We'll achieve this by building a proof of concept for layout editing using React and identifying the pain points. It's a major jump, just as the change to block-based editing in WordPress was. We can leverage prior art from the WordPress community with a uniquely Drupal focus on structured data. To do this will mean providing React versions of all our formatters and widgets and a way for developers to create their own. This is a big change, but it's something WordPress did to set themselves up for the future and now it's our turn. React is very powerful, we even used it to make this video. We'll need a JavaScript way to declare layouts and blocks, and we have a lot of metadata about these components already, so we aim to automate some of this. We'll leverage JSON API where possible, but also create new JSON endpoints for data that doesn't map to entities. Once we achieve a non-twig way of rendering widgets, formatters, blocks, and layouts, we will be able to keep the layout state in the browser, mutate it immediately, and persist to the back end in the background. Getting down to brass tacks, we're looking at six sprints to create a proof of concept and we propose an investment of US$20,000 to develop this initiative concept. To recap, we'll write an experimental decoupled layout builder module, design an API for describing and declaring React versions of layouts, widgets, formatters, block plugins, demonstrate communicating with Drupal to retrieve and update structured content, and build a proof of concept for a decoupled layout builder. This is a very cool idea that our whole team is stoked about. Thanks for considering our pitch. Awesome. So this is one I really like. Uh, Amy June submitted this. I just met Amy June for the first time right before this uh, event. Um, so welcome. I know you're in the back somewhere <laughs> with the cool kids. Uh, I love this one. Th thank you. I love this one because uh, she, you'll see she's talking about how do we rebuild the core contributor support materials and how do we nudge folks to meaningful contributions without turning them off uh, as mistakes are made along the way. Uh, I think there's a direct tie between innovation in Drupal and getting more contributors and bluntly younger contributors into the process and, and looking to the future. I love the tangible, she has little timelines on this, the tangible outcomes and deliverables. So let's take a look at the pitch. Hi, I am Amy June Heinlein, Volkswagen chick on Drupal.org and Aaron Winborn Award Ooh. winner. Um, and genuinely a good person who believes anyone can contribute to Drupal. I've been a mentor since 2016. In 2019, I was asked to join the core mentoring program um, as a team lead. I have the unique privilege of being a non-code developer and have the ability to bridge the gap between the technical writers, the coders, the developers, the designers, and connect them with first-time contributors with skill sets that match their specific contribution needs. I also work with the community working group on the community health team. And right now, my current project is creating productive language and dialogue templates around conversations about gaming the attribution system. Um, you might know these as nudges. There are two things I would like to work on. First, reimagining the Drupal core mentoring program. I'd like to rebuild the first time contributor workshops that we present at flagship events like DrupalCon and also build a program that empowers mentors outside of the core mentor group to present and help with mentor contributions at the local and regional camp levels, sort of a mentor the mentor program. This would involve perhaps modernizing um, the slide deck we have for DrupalCon, making it more accessible, and creating a more interactive workshop versus straight content delivery. We could provide scripting and knowledge-based documentation around the slide deck so any mentor can use the assets to give the workshop at their local um, or perhaps virtual event. Second, gaming the system. Um, is creating tension in the issue queue between contributors and maintainers. Some of the solutions that are being thrown around and discussed might block some contributors from receiving credits and perhaps demoralize um, novices um, from contributing more than once. 
And remember, you know, um, we're looking for repeat contributions for the longevity of the project. I want to build a presentation for our organizations and agencies and supporting partners who are starting in contributions, which would maybe highlight issue queue etiquette and appropriate first tasks for beginners and when to move past novice issues. It would also um, highlight some of the do's and the don'ts around adding files and submitting patches and merge requests. So with those two things, I'm asking for $6,000. Um, the funds would be used, one, to rebuild the assets for the first time contributor workshop. Second, build a presentation around best practices for organizations just starting in contributions. And third, attend DrupalCon Lil in Portland to run the workshops at actual events and get feedback so we can iterate and grow these programs. Thank you. So, the next one is uh, Drupal Gutenberg for Enterprise CMSs. This is Tor Andre Gretland from Front Frontcom in Norway. I feel like I'm in Eurovision, right? <laughs> we are going from Australia to the US to Norway. Um, again, here, this is the theme that we, you know, we heard a lot about this and uh, might be similar to what we heard before, but let's listen to what Tor Andre said. I'm Tor Andre Gretland from Frontcom. We're a digital consultancy focusing on Drupal with about 120 people. We want to make Drupal the most easy to use enterprise CMS. You use a CMS to manage content. And the question is not, can you do this in Drupal? Because the answer will always be yes these days. More important is, how easy is it? Will this system make our marketing department the winners in their market? Well, to achieve that, our solution must be easy, effective, and inspiring. And most complex websites are not easy, effective, and inspiring. They're difficult and clunky. We solve this with the Drupal Gutenberg editor, and our clients love it. In fact, we haven't built a Drupal website without Gutenberg since we started the project back in 2018. We make the editor experience closer to the front end, but with an extreme flexibility and extensibility. It's minimalistic to work with, yet with hundreds of possible options that works out of the box. This is the greatest enterprise tool for CMOs and content creators, inspiring them to work on content, update and optimize it for better conversion. More than 3,000 Drupal websites use it already, and outside of Drupal, the editor is already used by more than 80 million websites. The Drupal Gutenberg project has been up and running for a while now, but we want to take it to the next level. We're asking for 20,000 euros to arrange a workshop over a few days where we physically gather people from the WordPress core team that built the editor, the Drupal core team that knows the needs and possibilities for the admin initiatives and so on, and the Drupal Gutenberg team from Frontcom that built and maintained the Drupal Gutenberg module. We want things like creating a Gutenberg starter theme and a starter pack where Gutenberg is set up with a complete front end as a base theme or just a theming reference. We want to make it work also outside of the node edit form, like for Drupal block editing, single field editing, or to use it within the layout builder. Our goal is to make sure that Drupal Gutenberg of the future is always using the latest and greatest person from the WordPress team and better enable Drupal developers to contribute back upstream. We want Gutenberg more tightly integrated with Drupal. And to do this properly, we need to gather the people that should be involved. This is a great opportunity to extend our cooperation across open source projects and to move forward, making Drupal the most easy to use enterprise CMS. There we go. So obviously some of you in the room are wondering, well, you know, pitch A, I think it was, you know, it's about decoupled layout builder, this is about Gutenberg. Like, why would we fund them both, right? And so when we saw this in our you know, combined um, ranking, we actually deliberated, uh, we talked about this, and we actually felt like they are compatible because the last pitch around Gutenberg is about bringing together all of the different stakeholders, Gutenberg people, Drupal core developers, um, layout builder people, we can figure out who the right people are to figure out how do we actually get a great layout builder into core, and the second pitch could then be sequenced after, depending on what the outcome of the first meeting is. So if you as the audience decide to vote for both of them and we ended up funding both, we think that will work and we can work um, you know, with those two um, submitters, if you will, to make sure that that money is really well spent. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of that. 
because we actually did talk about this and we, we, we ended up feeling good about it. So that's it. Great. Let's go to the next one. I'm excited about this next pitch because it really proposes changing the way that Drupal stores and queries data in a way that could provide new capabilities like uh, no SQL features. So with that, let's take a look at the pitch. I'm Brad Jones, longtime Drupalista, full-time digital nomad, part-time paramedic. Greetings from beautiful Lake City, Colorado. I turned 40 this year, but you know what really makes me feel old? I remember when Drupal didn't even have fieldable entities in core. It's true. These days, one of the most basic functions of a site builder is to design entities and fields and their relationships to one another. Fields are at the core of Drupal, but just like me, fields in Drupal 10 are showing their age. The field API is a product of its birth date. Drupal 7 was released in January 2011, and fields were a real market differentiator. Think about this. Drupal 7 is six months older than Laravel. We were really ahead of our time. Back to present day, field API is still powerful, but if you're building a new product that needs room to grow and adapt, fields with set properties can be a restrictive pain point. Here's an example. I run a startup dating app. Much of my data model is as you'd expect. Profiles, matches, photos, you get the idea. But I also have to keep track of lots of other things like tokens for push notifications. I started with a map field that stores a push token and device ID. When I launched my web UI, I had to store additional tokens and metadata. It's all stored in what at the end of the day is just a text field in my database, a PHP serialized string. But what if I want to search for a property of that field, say to find duplicates? Because the data isn't normalized, I can't. Thankfully, time has marched on and all major database engines now support JSON data types, which means you can do things that look a lot like NoSQL inside of a relational database. And so, by extension, Drupal fields and queries. The core team has already decided to require JSON data type support for databases used in Drupal 10. It's now time to unleash that power. I propose to unblock and complete integration of field API, including entity queries, with JSON data storage. At the same time, we can easily extend the entity system to provide standards compliant JSON schemas out of the box. Zero code open API docs, anybody? We're not far from being the most flexible and performant data management system out there. I think it would take about $20,000 to pay myself and other qualified developers to knock it out. So let's do this. The, the next one is, is a submission from Christian from Factorial. Um, it's a great idea because we all know uh, uh, Contribution. We all know roles and permissions to uh, manage the policy access to core, and it would be great to have a much greater level of freedom. So let's watch this submission about policy-based access in core. Welcome to my pitch for policy-based access control in core. I am Christian van den Ende. You may know me as the author of the group module, and I have also written some supporting modules, namely variation cache and flexible permissions. Both are purely APIs, and they have zero bugs. What is policy-based access? Well, it's a, con uh, it's a type of system where people gain or lose access based on certain predetermined scenarios or policies. How does this differ from what we currently have in core? Well, currently we have permission-based or attribute-based access control, where you have to fit your access logic into assignable sets of permissions. There is no way to assign permissions based on context, such as time of day. And when it comes to attribute-based, you're limited to the subject and the account. What are the benefits or some examples of policy-based access? You may only be able to administer people when you have two-factor authentication enabled on your account. Because we value work-life balance, you may only edit your content during office hours. Or because we don't want hijacked accounts to cause a lot of damage, you may only delete up to three pieces of content per day. But there are many more scenarios possible. What do we need for this? Well, we need a new type of cache that can store highly variable calculated permissions. Then we need a centralized permission checker where we can check all of your policies in one place. And then we need an API to convert your policies into permissions. Now here's the good news. Reviewed and tested by the community. Reviewed and tested by the community. All code written already just needs to be converted into a patch for core. So let's talk numbers. We need about 15 days to get all of this to work and have a proof of concept that we can show works with access policies in core. 
This will cost about 12k and Factorial has offered us a reduced rate of 800 euros per day to get to that number. We have capacity at the end of this year and we hope to use DrupalCon Lil as an opportunity to sit down with core maintainers and help get this into core. It's already 90% complete, all of the code has been written, we just need to write some integration. Let's make magic. Thank you for your attention. So a number of the submissions that we received really spoke to the need to, to better enable developers that are just coming to Drupal and make that, that transition easier. And to me, this next pitch is uh, stood out because it, it potentially leverages AI as a way to, to make that transition easier, but, but also potentially support both novice Drupal developers as well as something that could be really useful for experienced Drupal developers as well. So let's take a look. AI Develop Assistant, creating systems using your natural language. Hi, I'm Lindogas. Recently, I have been working on Drupal Artificial Intelligence Meta issues. Because I think there is a lot of potential for Drupal and AI. For example, here I listed categories of features that could be created and visualized their current state. But how to create these many features, how to innovate quickly, how to adapt in an accelerating world, Maybe with the help of AI, I'm introducing AI Developer Assistant, which could help build Drupal systems using your natural language. Simply select a module you want to improve, give AI instructions in a future with your voice, talk with AI about improvements to the code, review and confirm the changes, and keep improving. Code Drupal inside of Drupal, build AI features with the help of AI. How can this be achieved? I posted this issue with the details, for example, giving AI access to configuration, to drush, to vision, and so on. Here I already published a module with some code. And to further advance the scores, I'm seeking 12,500 to fund 250 hours of development to implement first part of the roadmap and research second part. First part will enable you to talk with AI about the code base, and I tested this alone greatly improves productivity. To implement this, I will work with other module maintainers to code, test, and integrate universally useful features like chat interface and prompt engineering tools. Advance these features for any use case. I will also use some of this time to continue facilitate innovative Drupal AI ecosystem as cutting-edge AI research evolves. Drupal will be prepared and ready to adapt and maybe contribute in enabling whole society to adapt as well. All the links of issues will be in video description and thank you for your consideration. And last but not least, um, this is about Drupal API client. The use of Drupal as a decoupled backend is huge. And imagine if you had uh, a unified, clean API for all the JavaScript friends. Let's have a look at it. Hi, Sharks. I'm Brian Perry from Chicago, Illinois. And I'm here on behalf of the Drupal API client project. We're seeking $10,000 to build an extensible JavaScript API client for Drupal with the goal of eventually publishing the result under the Drupal namespace on NPM. Now, sharks, let's face it. <laughs> Drupal Core has got great APIs to make data available to decoupled applications, but we fall short when it comes to helping JavaScript developers consume that data. That's where the Drupal API client project comes in. Our goal is to create a framework agnostic base class with defaults for things like data fetching and caching that can easily be overridden to support different implementations or even different API types. We then plan on extending that base class to create a complete client package for Drupal's implementation of JSON API. Sharks, we've handed out some samples by way of a small proof of concept. This is the API client class, which has a constructor, and implements a fetch method, which has a default, but can also be easily overridden. And this JSON API client extends that class, but implements get collection, which allows us to get a collection of resources from JSON API. And the GraphQL client extends the same class, but implements a query method to query GraphQL. Now, Sharks, we see that you have some questions. Like, why do we believe we'll be successful? 
<laughs> We've already had a number of key contributors from the decoupled Drupal ecosystem express interest in participating. What are we going to do with our funds? This is a high-level breakdown of how we plan on using the $10,000. Primarily, we want to use it to be able to allow people to participate who wouldn't have been able to contribute otherwise. And as far as what we're going to deliver, we're going to create the project, develop a vertical slice proof of concept that will allow us to put together an early proposal for the Drupal JavaScript maintainers as we continue to work on the JSON API client, and also scaffold an initial GraphQL client as well. Thanks for your time, Sharks, and together we can make the Drupal API client a reality. Am I good? Am I done? I was told that I would meet Mark Cuban. <laughs> 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 All right, so these were our seven picks. I hope you liked them. Did you like them? Yeah. yeah. So this will be the exciting part, <laughs> and hopefully it will work. Um, but as I mentioned, now we're going to use your phones. Uh, I'm going to show you and I'm going to explain you how it works. But we're going to show you in a, in a little bit, we're going to show you a URL that you're going to have to type into your phone. I don't know if you need to get off the Wi-Fi or not. If you have um, you know, like a regular cell phone subscription that works in the US, you may want to use that instead of Wi-Fi. I'm not sure. We're also going to show you a QR code. So you can probably keep your camera ready as well. It's going to be a little bit easier. Um, but once you open that uh, web page, it's a um, SurveyMonkey uh, tool, you'll be able to stack rank all of the seven um, you know, pitches. And you can do that using your finger by dragging and dropping, uh, or you can use arrows, whatever uh, you prefer. Um, and it will give you about two minutes to do that. After two minutes, um, the music will stop, and the voting will close. And we need about 30 seconds to um, sort of um, tally the results and put them up on the screen. And then we're going to reveal the winner. Uh, as I mentioned, we can't fund everyone. Uh, so the outcome will be a stack ranking. And then we'll go down uh, from highest rank to lowest rank. And we'll kind of see how much we can fund. Because actually, if you add up all these numbers, it's over 100,000. And so obviously, there's going to be one, two, maybe three that fall off the bottom that unfortunately uh, we won't be able to fund. So that's the plan. Uh, hopefully, that was clear. Um, so let's, let's go. Let's do it. Let's see. People need more time? Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, let's, let's give it a little bit more time if that's possible. Um, we do want people's votes in as much. I think there's some internet connection issues, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so let, let's add a little bit more time. We have 435 already. Okay, so that's if, pretty good. If they got so a white screen, it might have been in. Even, even with the white screen, it might have gone in. So while you vote, um, well, we give you a little bit more time. Um, I will say we had 35 submissions, and there's, you know, obviously those seven were pretty good, but there was many, many others that were amazing and hard to choose from. And one of the things we're going to do is after the Dries notes, or after today or tomorrow, we're going to publish all 35 videos. So I would definitely encourage you to go check out some of these other videos. And of course, yeah. if any of you want to fund one of these videos, you can. Um, you know, if your company um, or yourself want to help contribute funding to any of them, please just come talk to us. You can talk to the Drupal Association. You can talk to any of the judges here right. on stage, and we'll help you. Uh, will help write you to the right, um, you know, to the right, to the right mechanisms and people to do so. Um, so how's it going? The numbers are up. Okay. We have now almost 600 submissions. Okay. I think we are like. I think that's good. It's getting. Yeah, it's you know. not meant to be academically precise. <laughs> um, <laughs> the 600. That's probably a good representation. Yeah, I think, I think this room takes 1,100 people or something. Yeah. So we are having at least half of them answering here, so yeah, looking so good. Whenever, whenever we're ready, I think we can show the results and we can try and tally the votes and see you know, what we can fund. So at uh, any moment now, the results could come on screen. Um, and we'll see. We're so the question is going to be, now. for those who know Eurovision, you know, Dries, are you going to say the numbers in French? <laughs> because DrupalCon is happening in France <laughs> in this fall. So let's see. <laughs> But talking about the Europe Sunk uh, vision, like one of the things that's interesting about it is like sort of the judges, the countries, they actually are re responsible for half of the votes. And then the audience, which is people all around the world, are responsible for the other half of the votes. And we kind of like that idea and we try to, you know, bring that into, um, into this a little bit where the judges gave some points and then hopefully you'll all be able to give some points as well. So. Um, the other thing I can say while we work on the results is um, this is kind of a first time that we're doing this. And, and one of the things we've talked about is um, potentially doing it again at future DrupalCons if you like it. Um, and if you think about it, it's really a matchmaking program between some of the best ideas in the Drupal community and then poten and funders, people that want to contribute to Drupal uh, financially, right? And, not something that we've really had in Ooh. this form, and it doesn't always have to have this shape or form. Oh, the results are in. Well, let's take a look. We're going to have to do some real-time calculations here, but number okay, one is clearly the decoupled layout builder. So we should fund that. Yes. <laughs> Gutenberg is number two. Okay. So we have definitely need to fund that. I, I'm pretty sure we can continue funding uh, JSON um, data and schemas, which appears to be the number three. Well, we had how, almost, how much is that already? Yeah, we all had almost seven, 700 submissions, or like voting. Yeah, we had almost 700, so I think that's yeah. good. Yeah. Which was number three? Uh, number three was the JSON, uh, JSON data and schema. Okay, so how much do we have then? That's 62,000. 62? From the All first right, we've three. got more. Yeah, right. So the next yeah. one, I think, is the Drupal API client. Yep. So <laughs> we have 75,000. How much do we have left? We're at 72,000 now. Ooh. Ooh. So we only have 3,000 <laughs> We have 3,000 more. All right, so what so would have been the next one? Uh, <laughs> trying to policy-based, is that right? No. Oh, no, no, the B, B. Yep. Contributing, the, the mentorship. Amy um, Dune. <laughs> so Amy needed 6,000. And we, ha we have 3,000 to give. Yeah. Right. So yeah. we have 3,000 shorts. Um, so we'll, anyone that wants to fund 3,000, come to us. Uh, if not, we'll fund you for 3,000. Somebody's raising their hand? OK, right. so come to us afterwards. <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Very 
good. So we're, unfortunately, we're out of money. <laughs> um, but it's for today, yes. But hopefully we can you know, find other ways to fund these remaining projects and then some of the projects we haven't shown. Uh, that actually wraps up the Dries notes. I want to thank everybody. Um, two quick things. If you have questions for me about today's keynote or other things, there will be a Q&A session later today. Uh, you can see it on the screen. Uh, second announcement, we are going to leave the room and take our group photo, as mentioned, and that's going to be next to the giant um, Truplicon uh, out in the hallway just outside. And with that, I'd like to thank my judges. I'd like to thank all of the people that contributed and sponsored um, you know, the contest. Thank you.